Twilight Inscription is a roll and write game in which one to eight players compete for galactic dominance through interplanetary exploration, technological superiority, industrial zeal, and raw military might. Players assume the leadership of a single faction, each with their own unique strengths and weaknesses, as they navigate an ever-shifting series of events, contend with dynamic political agendas, pursue challenging objectives, and chase down mysterious but powerful relics. Game rounds are guided by events, cards that put play into motion by allocating resources or commanding quick decisions through an upset in galactic stability. But be careful, you aren't just playing the sheets that you control. You're locked in competition with the other factions, all of whom wish to claim the throne, Mechatol Rex, and control the entire galaxy. Victory can only be achieved through cunning, diplomacy, strategy, and a bit of good fortune. A player's game board consists of four sheets, each with their own goals, rewards, and challenges. These sheets are for navigation, expansion, warfare, and industry. Players who prefer more variety should use side A of their sheets, which are all unique. For a symmetrical game, use side B, all of which are identical to each other. Once each player has their sheets arranged, they must choose a faction. To do this, the faction deck is shuffled and each player is given three cards at random. The player then chooses from those three cards the faction that they prefer to play as. The faction card is placed next to their gameplay sheets and the unused cards are returned to the game box. Each faction has two abilities, one that is active from the start of the game and the other which is resolved each time the player claims a faction asset. One common goal in the game is to reach Mechatol Rex, the center of the fallen Lazix Empire, and a site of great political significance. Prepare the Mechatol Rex sheet by placing it in the center of the table. When playing a game with three or more players, use the side of the sheet with the Members section. If you're playing a game with one or two players, use the side with the AI opponent. While everything covered in this video applies to a game group of any size, the rulebook includes a section of additional rules for solo and two-player games. With Mechatol Rex in place, it is time to prepare the agenda cards. These cards represent political upsets that must be resolved through diplomacy and voting. Shuffle the Stage 2 Agenda cards, choose one at random, and place it face down below Mechatol Rex. Then do the same for the Stage 3 and Stage 4 Agenda cards. With the Agenda cards in place, it's time to prepare the Event Deck. This is done by separating the Event Deck into 10 piles according to their backs and shuffling each pile. Then stack the Stage 5 cards face down, starting with a blue card on the bottom and alternating between blue and black. The other stages are then constructed in the same way. Next, these decks are combined into a single deck with Stage 5 on the bottom and Stage 1 on the top. Once the deck is prepared, place it to the right of Mechatol Rex. The next group of cards to be prepared are the objectives. These are goals that all players may work towards, hoping to capture their handsome rewards. Separate the objective cards by type into four decks, Navigation, Expansion, Warfare and Industry, and then shuffle these decks. Choose one random card of each type and place those four cards above Mechatol Rex. The side of the card with two point values should be facing up. The larger number is the reward that awaits the first player to complete the objective. The smaller number is what will be awarded to all subsequent players who meet that objective. The unused objective cards are then returned to the game box. The final deck to be prepared is the Relic deck. Shuffle all Relic cards and place the deck face down next to Mechatol Rex. 
With all the cards, sheets, and decks in place, it's time to give each player a marker and a reference card. The former is for writing on the game sheets, and the latter is a handy glossary of game icons and meanings. Finally, choose a speaker. This position should be assigned to the most experienced player at the table. There are no in-game benefits for being a speaker. Their function is to keep the game running smoothly by handling the event deck and dice rolls. With setup complete, this is how your table should look for a three-player game. Player Sheets Your unique playstyle will be expressed through the allocation of resources among your four sheets in the pursuit of assets. The game can be won by focusing on a few sheets or efficiently investing in all four. New players are encouraged to focus on navigation and expansion as they learn the game mechanics and develop their playstyle. Resources Throughout the game, resources are allocated equally to all players, both through event cards and dice rolls. How you use your resources is entirely up to you. There are three types of resources in the game, material, influence, and research. These resources can be used in different ways across the four player sheets. Assets. Used wisely, resources will allow players to claim assets. While there are many types of assets across the galaxy, players should keep a keen eye toward victory point assets, which will directly contribute to the player's score at the end of the game. As you claim assets, be mindful of the outline. An asset with a dotted outline must be resolved immediately. An asset with a dashed outline does not have an immediate effect and can be saved until the moment the player finds them most advantageous. Twilight Inscription is played over a series of rounds, each one starting with the reveal of an event card. Once revealed, the event card is read aloud by the speaker and all players react to the card simultaneously. There are four types of event cards, strategy, war, council, and production, with each card having the potential to embolden ambitious players and upset long brewing strategies. To see the event cards in action and how they will affect gameplay, we will simulate five rounds of play with each round focusing on a different core mechanic. For this purpose, we will display only the event deck and the player sheets. To begin the game, the speaker flips the first event card, starting the first round of play. The game begins with the speaker drawing the first event card, in this case Fledgling Empire, which affords each player two influence resources. Before you can spend strategy card resources, you have to choose your active sheet. Players decide their active sheet each round and can choose from any of the four. The active sheet is the one where you will be spending resources at the cost of focusing on the three other sheets for that round. The player chooses navigation as their active sheet. Each navigation sheet has a home system that is already circled, and that system has a few lines drawn to nearby systems. There are two types of actions you can take on the navigation sheet. You can explore and claim systems. Exploration is achieved with research and material resources and represented by drawing a line to the new system you are exploring. Systems are claimed with influence resources and this is represented by circling the system. The player spends their two influence resources from Fledgling Empire to claim two of the three explored systems on their sheet, the Planet System and the Victory Point System. When all players are ready, the speaker rolls the dice. This player hasn't unlocked access to any focus dice, so they only have the resources showing on the black dice, two material resources and one influence. The player uses one material and one influence to explore the nearest planet and claim it. With one material left to spend, the player explores past the triangle commodity, arriving at the diamond commodity and claiming neither. Research resources can also be used to unlock new technologies on the active sheet. 
One of two technologies on the navigation sheet is the gravity drive, which allows exploration through wormholes. Wormholes make it possible to jump across the galaxy easily, and on some navigation sheets, even give you access to systems otherwise impossible to reach. Having spent all resources, round one is over. Round two begins with the speaker drawing the next event card, revealing echoes of the past. This card allows the player to spend one of each resource, material, influence, and research. The player chooses the expansion sheet as their active sheet. The expansion sheet is the main source of population, which can be worth many victory points and specialty assets. The expansion sheets contain a variety of planets that begin the game locked but can be unlocked as the navigation sheet is explored. Once unlocked, a player can develop the planet at the cost of resources. The player can currently unlock two planets because they claimed two in the first round of play. A planet is unlocked by drawing a single slash through any claimed planet on the navigation sheet and crossing out the relevant planet icon on the expansion sheet. The player claims the bottom left industrial planet and the bottom right cultural planet. Now that the player has claimed their two planets, they can use their resources to develop them. The player allocates all three resources on their industrial planet, which allows them to claim a red specialty asset. They could use the red specialty asset in the future to unlock powerful ships on the warfare sheet. So neighbors, beware. This player may be planning an aggressive strategy centered on war. Having spent the card resources, the speaker rolls the dice, revealing again one of each resource. The player marks one more material and one more influence on their industrial planet, apparently making a play towards population growth. The research resource is used towards constructing a space dock. Once the space dock is built, either by spending a planet asset or enough resources, the player could unlock access to the blue focus die on a preferred sheet. For now though, round two is completed. The speaker turns over the next event card revealing first ventures and beginning the third round of play. For the third round, the player chooses industry as their active sheet. This is where a player can invest in infrastructure and their economy. The industry sheet is also where the player keeps track of council votes and trade goods. Industrial expansion is achieved through scrapping or claiming spaces, starting from the pre-printed scrapped space and spreading outward via adjacent spaces. A player can spend material to scrap a space or they can use research and influence to claim one. While scrapping an asset on the industry grid destroys it, this is often a necessary investment. A player can only claim an asset that is touching one that is scrapped. Finding a balance between scrapping and claiming is vital to a successful industrial campaign. Material can only be used to scrap spaces and the player chooses to travel east and north through the grid, scrapping the adjacent circle, triangle and diamond assets. While this might seem like a terrific sacrifice of resources, it has actually opened the board up handsomely for the player. At the start of this round, they could only claim circle commodities. Now the player has access to all commodity types, as well as a counselor and a green focus asset. Counselors and columns of commodities produce votes and trade goods respectively, but they don't do this immediately. This happens during council events and production events. The speaker rolls the dice, revealing three influence resources. The player claims three spaces, the counselor, the green focus asset, and a yellow commodity. The counselor immediately unlocks a plus one vote on the industry chart. The player also immediately marks the yellow circle commodity in the industry chart, which earns them a plus one trade good. Counselors and commodities are marked on the industry chart immediately, regardless of what sheet they originated from. The player chooses to save the green focus asset for later, and the third round of play is now over.
The speaker draws the fourth card from the deck, revealing toward a new home, which gives three material resources to all players. This round, the player decides to focus on their warfare sheet, which is unique among the four player sheets. While all strategies and play styles require some awareness of how other players are allocating their resources, the warfare sheet is the only one in which players interact directly with each other. Here you can build instruments of war and deploy these units from the bottom of your war grid, working your way up to the top. Your grid is split down the middle, with nodes on the left half counting towards wars with players to your left, and nodes on the right half counting towards wars with the player to your right. Units can be rotated as the player prefers on deployment, but they must be adjacent to at least one other unit in the player's armada, or the deployment line at the bottom of the grid. The infantry, PDS, and cruiser are available to all from the start of the game. The Dreadnought and War Sun must be unlocked before they can be built. First, the player builds a cruiser using all three of the material resources to do so. Units must be deployed as soon as they are built. The player deploys their cruiser vertically on the right side of their grid, claiming the victory point as they do. Material resources spent, the speaker rolls the dice revealing two material and one research on the black dice. The focus dice reveal one material, one influence, and two research. The player unlocks the dreadnought with the red specialty asset from the expansion sheet and unlocks the green focus die earned on the industry sheet. Using the black dice, the player builds one dreadnought and deploys it, claiming a victory point in the process. They then use the green focus die to start construction on two more dreadnoughts, which can be finished during a future round. Round 4 is now over. So far, all rounds of play demonstrated have centered on a player allocating resources to grow their own faction's presence in the galaxy. But tensions between factions will boil over, and this resolves as warfare between players. Each stage of the event deck, with the exception of the first, contains a war event, and revealing this card instantly plunges the galaxy into violent combat. Each player resolves two wars, one against each neighbor. The winner of the war is granted a valuable asset, while losing a war will cost the player precious victory points. Your strength during the war is determined by the marked nodes on your warfare sheet when the event occurs. All marked nodes, including asset nodes, add one strength to that section. When the war is over, the nodes in that section are no longer active, and you must begin building your armada anew in the next section. When a war event card is drawn, all players must first advance the deployment line. This is done by tracing over the next dashed horizontal line of the war grid. The deployment line represents the new bottom of the grid. New units cannot be deployed below it. You then tally up all marked nodes in the left section immediately below the new deployment line and then do the same for the right half. The player in this game has scored 5 strength on the left and 3 on the right, and so they write those numbers in the corresponding boxes. The player compares the number in the left strength box with the number in the right strength box of the neighbor to the left. The player's number is higher, meaning that they have won this war and can claim the spoils. They then repeat this process to the right, losing that war, and in doing so, losing one victory point. When all wars are resolved, the event is over and a new round begins. In addition to strategy and war events, there are also production and council events, which are explained fully in the rulebook. Production events represent a faction's economic might coming to fruition. When a production event card is drawn, each player produces trade goods equal to the trade good production icon marked on the industry chart. Trade goods can then be spent as any resource on the active sheet of a future strategy event. Council events represent the convening of the Galactic Council. During these events, each player votes on a pressing agenda, hoping to sway the outcome in their favor. 
Each player generates a vote for each counselor icon marked on their industry chart. The agenda is declared, the votes are cast, and then the outcome is resolved. Refer to the rule book for full details on this process. The game ends when the players resolve a Throne for the Taking, an event card that will trigger the final war of the game. When the Dust of War settles, the players tally up the scores on their four sheets. This is done by adding up the values of their victory points and combining that number with any points they won completing objectives. Players must also subtract the victory points related to losses taken during warfare. With the tallies completed on each sheet, the player sums their sheet totals to determine their final score. The speaker then writes these scores on the Mechatol Rex sheet next to the faction's name. The player with the highest score is the new ruler of the galaxy. There are game mechanics outside the scope of the five rounds demonstrated in this video. The reference cards provide a brief description of each asset, and the rulebook provides a full explanation of gameplay, assets, and the Mechatol Rec Sheet. But the topics covered in this video will be enough to get your first game started while leaving ample room for discovery. Twilight Inscription is a roll-and-write game that invites you to develop your own play style and approach to galactic domination. Whether you prefer to grow your empire through planetary exploration, industrial research and development, or brutal warfare, you can carve out your own path to victory in Twilight Inscription.